In this video, I'll be comparing flash and LED panels for toy photography. Okay, so flash. A lot of people get intimidated by this, so let's jump right in and defang this beast. So the back of this flash looks complicated, but you'll only be dealing with changing the intensity for the most part. Let's turn this thing on so I can show you. Flash power, or flash output, is presented in fractions. 1 over 128 on this flash is the least powerful, and dialing through it gets more powerful, with 1 over 1 obviously the highest output available. The camera needs a way to communicate with the flash, so you need to attach a trigger to your camera's hot shoe. This one is angled for better viewing, so it does add some height to your camera. But if you prefer something more low profile, there's a model for that too. The LCD is much smaller, and there are fewer buttons on this, which means there are usability issues. But that's for another video. Let's look at this trigger. By turning the dial, I can change the flash power from behind my camera. I can control several other flashes from here too. I know, there are a lot of buttons here, but for this beginner video, we're just going to use the trigger to adjust flash power and fire the flash. Another neat thing about a flash is that you can rotate and tilt the flash head. That makes it much easier to change the direction of the light. And the last thing I'm going to talk about in this beginner video is the zoom feature. This allows you to widen or tighten the beam of light. 28mm for wide and 200mm for narrow, similar to the field of view of a lens. You can see the flash head moving in and out as I change the zoom setting. The closer it is to the front, the wider the beam of light will be. This is a pretty neat trick for a light this size. Okay, let's talk about LED panels and see how they differ from flash. The back of this light source is much less complicated. It's just two dials, one for color temperature and the other for brightness. This bicolor LED panel can go from a warm 3300K to a cool 5600K by turning this dial. I've set it down and turned off the overhead light so we can see the effect better. The next dial is for brightness expressed in percentages. Here's the LED at its brightest and dimmest. This LED has diffusion built into it, so the light that comes from this is a soft, even light. Here's what it looks like up close. The cost of this diffusion is of course brightness, as the light from the LEDs have to pass through this layer. There are 116 LEDs here, but it looks like one soft light source. Barely a shadow from this pen at this distance. Let's look at another LED, this time a really cheap and small one. You can see the array of LEDs clearly. There's no diffusion on this. On the back, there's a single switch to turn it on and off. No dimmers. Not looking promising already, but let's turn this on to see the characteristics of this light. Ugh, a green color cast. You can clearly see the color in each LED. LEDs tend to have color spikes because they can't produce the full spectrum of colors to make white, so you have to find one with a CRI of 90 or higher. The other LED panel has a CRI of 95. This cheap LED panel doesn't produce an even light either. When I put this pen down in front of it, you can see that it casts several distinct shadows. Okay, let's put these lights to the test. To get a similar quality of light, I put a small softbox about the size of the LED panel on the flash to make it a soft light source. Here I've got this LEGO street cleaner that I'm going to shoot with a 50mm vintage macro lens. Let's start with a nice LED panel for this shootout. And I'm going to flip it over so I can show you the settings.
Let's switch that on and put that camera left at an angle. That's looking good. Notice how close the LED is to the street cleaner. It's about the length of a pen. Now let's take the shot. This is the LED panel at maximum brightness plus the overhead ambient light. I've got a much larger LED panel up here to light this video, so let's turn that off. And another shot. Here's just the light from the LED panel. Next, let's try the shot using the flash with a small softbox on it. It's at its lowest power setting of 1 over 128, and it's going to lose some light because of the softbox too. Let's put the softbox right where the LED panel was. Turn on the trigger. Make sure the flash settings match, okay. And take a shot. So here's the diffuse flash and the ambient light from overhead. Again, let's turn off the overhead light and take another shot. So this is the photo with just the flash. Just for fun, I'll do a shot with that cheap LED panel. Oh god, look at that. Green and hard shadows. Oof. Okay, so let's review these images in more detail so we can really see what's going on. I've shot the same photo but at 1 over 160 shutter speed to compare as well. On the top row are photos taken with the flash, and on the bottom row are the photos taken with the LED panel. The first two photos on the left were shot at 1 over 50 shutter speed and the overhead light turned on, so basically two light sources. These two exposures look really similar. Let's look at the two photos in the middle. These were shot at 1 over 150, but with the overhead light turned off. The background and the shadows in the flash photo are noticeably darker. And now let's look at the last pair of photos on the right. These were taken at a higher shutter speed of 1 over 160, with the overhead light still turned off. The photo taken with the LED panel is significantly darker. It just isn't powerful enough to handle high shutter speeds. So what does that mean? Let's have a look at capturing falling rain. A shutter speed of 1 over 160 and the flash at its lowest power is enough to freeze the droplets in place in this photo. To do the same with an LED panel at 100% brightness, I had to increase the shutter speed by over 4 stops and the ISO by almost 5 stops. Check out the difference in sharpness and noise in these photos. The LED panel is not bright, but let's meter for thoroughness. I've got my light meter and I'm going to measure the light from here to the minifig. I'm just measuring the LED panel. So with my preferred shutter speed set to 1 over 60 and the ISO to 100, the light meter is telling me that I need an aperture of f5 to get a perfect exposure. Now for the flash, same thing, I'm just measuring the light from the flash. With the flash at its lowest power and the shutter speed and ISO the same as before, the light meter says I need to set the aperture on my camera to f5.6. Similar aperture values. Yeah, except remember that the LED is at its fullest power and the flash is at its lowest. If I needed more light, I could simply increase the flash power instead of having to compensate with settings or setup. And when you're dealing with this, you don't want to be slowing your shutter speed. So flash looks like the winner, but does it fit your style? Let's talk about who an LED panel might be for then. If you want to see the effects in real time, an LED panel is for you. It's a continuous light, so you can see what the lighting looks like right in front of your eyes. 
you can more easily watch for issues like cast shadows and hotspots and correct them by either adjusting the light position or moving your figures around before you take the shot. If you mainly shoot with soft light, this works great. Right out of the box, the panel gives off soft light because there's diffusion built in. But if your LED panel doesn't, you'd need to set up an additional support to hold up some kind of diffusion between it and the subject. If you're on a budget, you can start with lighting without breaking the bank. This LED panel is about $40 on Amazon, with a battery and charger included. If you want something uncomplicated, it's hard to beat an LED panel that has two dials. If you shoot indoors or at night, an LED panel is bright enough to get the job done for general toy photography. So now flash. If you like to freeze particles like dust in the air or catch a splash of water, a flash can easily do that because it's so powerful. If you want the cleanest, sharpest image possible, using flash means you don't have to bump up your ISO to get a good exposure. And its action freezing light also prevents blur. If you want to change the shape, spread, quality, or color of the light, a range of different kinds of light modifiers from snoots to grids to gels are readily available for every budget. The softbox I used to create a soft light in this video is like $10. If you want to be able to turn individual flashes on and off or adjust flash output levels remotely, you can do that from behind the camera with the trigger. So you can take a shot, review the photo, and change the brightness of a flash, for example. The trigger is an additional cost at around $40 to $70 depending on the model. If you want to be able to have different exposures for your background and subject, a manual flash is the answer. Shutter speed doesn't affect flash exposure. So that opens up a lot of creative opportunities. So those are the main reasons why you'd want one light over another. There are limitations and trade-offs, whatever kind of light you use, flash or LED panel. You just need to understand the tools and use the right one for the job. The bottom line is, the lighting should fit your vision rather than your vision having to fit your lighting. Don't get boxed in because of your lighting gear and let that define your style. Okay, so thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll be back again soon with another video. Until then.